star bloom it is so good to see all of you it's been quite an amazing festival um you know absolutely went from sound baths to crystalline energy to channeling um all across the board i think it's been such a beautiful second annual star bloom and i just want to send an extended thanks to everybody who's been involved uh, this has been an absolutely incredible experience and i can't wait to just see how it evolves um, you know, as we go along, there's so much left to really express and uh, convey. Before I get too far along, my name is Spencer, aka Junk DNA. You might know me well on Instagram, and I am the founder of Starbloom, um, something that came as a seated manifestation in my mind of really coming together as a collective and sharing our wisdom, our experience, and our love in such a unified space and it's amazing to see how it's come to being so thank you for all of you that showed up who are watching the replay or who have just held space throughout this festival um, we love you and we are so happy that you are actively moving the collective in your own way so thank you and today i'm here to talk to you about uh <laughs> drum roll please ufos and this is a very intimate topic that something that's really radically changed my life uh, for the better. And it really enhanced my curiosity, um, especially at a young age, but moving more into my awakening. Uh, this was one of the foundational pivot points of looking up and thinking there has to be more. You know, there's just so much beauty out there. There's so much space. And if it's completely empty, then it's a hollow void of a reality and a universe. And what a, what a waste of space. So without further ado, let me just share my keynote really quick. Go. And I want everybody out there to know that if you are a skeptic or someone who doesn't necessarily buy into the UFO phenomena, I dare you to expand your consciousness and imagination to really encapsulate what it means to be alive within the universe. Okay, we are on this simple planet, simple but beautiful planet amidst hundreds and billions of planets in the universe. And that's only what we can physically observe. There's so much beyond and it's just infinite. And ultimately, if you start to really concept how big space really is and how much matter there is out there these beautiful suns these planets that orbit them they have a purpose there's an intention to this and what that told me is that life thrives in this kind of space we're held so that we can grow both spiritually mentally and physically and i think it's so amazing that we can tie in all of our experiences with distant neighbors and distant, distant interdimensional um, consciousness out there. And that's the whole point of the UFO phenomena is to really understand that you're not alone, that you've never been alone, but you've always been watched from the sidelines. And I wanna draw your attention now to the screen you're looking at. And the picture you're seeing at the moment is, the, um, is one of the most scrubbed images from the internet. This was an old photograph taken of one of the first saucers recorded. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that they don't want you to see this. So of course, I'm going to put it as my first slide. Um, and it's beautiful because back when you work with film, film was very grainy and very clear and in indicating what you were actually seeing. There was no doctoring of footage or evidence. This is what you see is what you get. Uh, you shake the Polaroid and that's it. So basically, this is what was happening um, back in the early 40s and 50s, um, and then moving on to the 70s, as we'll progress throughout this. But I just wanted to draw your attention to, to see a real UFO. If you've never seen one before, you're looking at one and start to process how that makes you feel, you know, knowing that there's other beings in the universe, that you are not alone. But not only that, that they're able to accomplish fantastic feats. And that's what we're here to discover today. So what is a UFO? 
a lot of people get, you know, hung up on this concept of, oh, it's just something that we don't know what it is yet. And while that's true, there is a testament to saying that it's not something of our own reality or even yet of our world. Um, lots of things they try to brush off and cover up, such as blimps, um, weather balloons, planes, um, but none of these objects act in the same way as a UFO, exhibiting this free form movement that technically goes against physics as we know it. And when you start to study the UFO phenomena, you'll realize that there is a whole different means of physics going on here. And it all has to do with electromagnetism and uh, electrogravitics, aka free energy. Um, and this is a huge test. This is why they want to censor this so bad is because if the, if the world became aware of the UFO phenomena and that it had, we had free energy, not only access to it, but it was possible and it was feasible and that many minds from our distant past and up to, uh, you know, more, more recent minds such as Tesla are bringing forth this information to better the collective then that would ruin business for them. So you have to see how covering up something is more so a service to self. It allows them to conceal and perpetrate anything that they so please, which ultimately gets against the free will concept of life. So the UFOs, they come in a variety of forms as we'll discover here today. But ultimately what you need to know is that UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object. Of course, they're trying to sugarcoat it with some new name now, um, USAP or something of the sort that you'll probably hear in mainstream media. But what you need to know is that the UFO phenomena is just an umbrella term for all of these fantastic uh, vehicles that we see in our skies. So let's, let's explore the types of UFOs. Um, basically, the way I can categorize it is more in an archetypal sense in what is real versus what is artificial. And I think it's really interesting to kind of take this dualistic perspective and understand that the real craft are the ones that give you goosebumps, the ones that inspire you to change yourself and love, while the artificial ones make you feel cold, hollow, and separated from another. And that's the whole duality of you know, trying to replicate something that was already burst into existence in its most natural, purest state. And what you're going to notice is that these light ships, the ones that we see in our skies, uh, they come in a variety of forms, but more so it's about the intention, the feeling behind encountering one of these UFOs or witnessing them. It's a whole different energy when you compare that to something that's more uh, man-made or man-replicated. And so as you can see here in this Venn diagram, we basically explore um, the different qualities of each and how at the very center, they do share some of the same qualities, but that's only because the artificial one was trying to replicate that of the organic. So we want to just look into this. And ultimately, if you're outside and you're trying to discern what is a real UFO versus what is ours, um, the best way to do it is through your in intuition. You know deep inside what is real, what is true. And if you can keep that same focus, you'll be able to see through the noise, see through the distortion of what you're actually perceiving. And so, of course, if we're going to talk about UFOs, we have to go way back. And uh, this, even uh, as you're seeing on the screen right now, these Mayan recollections, these depictions of UFOs, um, in their mainstream society um, were so commonly accepted because the ones that were visited for the most part were ha had a positive polarization, meaning that they came to help and serve others accordingly by helping them expand their technology or showing them different ways of doing things in a more efficient way. So what you'll see in all of these, um, in all these graphics is an actual... Um, acknowledgement of UFOs and extraterrestrials. And when I say extraterrestrials, that's another umbrella term. We can go into that. There's a whole concept of extraterrestrials versus extra um, interdimensionals. And both exist, by the way, a little just disclosure there. Um, it just depends on what energy you're working with and what you're seeing. 
But for the most part, when UFOs come to this planet, and this has been a concept or a question in many minds uh, across the world is why would they come? You know, why would they just observe us from above? And the reality of the situation is that they're observing our growth, or at least the positively polarized benevolent ones are. They come here in respect of our free will to observe and assist by telepathically communicating guidance and certain things that we need to know um, to grow as a human being on this planet. And so with that being said, you can't necessarily know everything because there is a boundary of separation and knowing that's just standard and needed so that you can be immersed into this experience and really get all you can out of it. So that's why when you see them hovering in the skies or tucked within a cloud, each one does so to prevent causing distortion in our perception. Because as we've seen in the past, when something of extraordinary power and exotic nature comes to the light, it's often worshipped and it's often brought to a singular place where it demeans anything that is observing it. But the benevolent, positively polarized extraterrestrials and extra dimensionals that are here out of service for others, they want us to be our guiding light. They're there just to hold space, hold the energetics, and observe. And more often than not, the ones that come to this planet are closely affiliated with souls that are incarnate on the planet at the time. So you can have star family actually observing you from just outside the atmosphere and not even realize it. And so that's why we are having this unofficial disclosure today to really bring that awareness to your consciousness. And of course, as this goes along, humans find a way of really uh, encapsulating uh, these experiences. And one is through artwork. And I think this is an absolutely beautiful thing because with art, you have an artist's eye, an artist's perspective on how detailed the experience is. And so as you see off to your left, um, a very medieval, uh, medieval painting, um, as you see, that was one of the phenomena that happened in the sky where there were all these different objects, all these different UFOs that appeared one night and it was brought into this painting, um, this painting style to really capture that moment. Because if you could just imagine that occurring in modern day, there would be you know, a frenzy. People wouldn't know how to react. So of course, when you go back in time and you, you scale back the clock, you start to realize that there was more of an acceptance of this phenomena back then because there weren't smartphones, there weren't skeptics, people really did appreciate everything as it was and they let that come in and sink in. So I think that was absolutely beautiful and phenomenal. And as you see through the other ones too, um, very, very clear shapes that were projected. These aren't stars, these aren't anything other than what they appear to be, which is some kind of craft that is exotically in our atmosphere and in our skies. So of course, the first thing you think of when you concept a UFO is a flying saucer. And just as an earlier in the talk with uh, JJ, she mentioned back in 1947, the Roswell crash and everything, that's what really made this, um, this shape infamous over time. But the flying saucer shape in itself is a divine creation because it has symmetry and it has everything it needs to balance itself against the gravitics of Earth to maintain stable um, stability. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that a little bit deeper as well. But yes, disc-shaped UFOs as well. Um, there's a, a bunch of different terms, top hat, uh, as you go down the list, but they all kind of refer to the same general shape. And so as you're seeing below, these are some of the best sightings that I've personally found of these, these craft hovering in our skies and lurking about. As you see in the top middle image, this is one of the most profound light ship recordings I've ever come across. And what this indicates is that it has almost like a, a biophotonic essence to it, meaning that it illuminates not from a single light source, but as an entire craft itself. And this is something that's very commonplace with a bunch of these sightings, especially the, uh, the more notable benevolent craft. 
But then as you look around off to the sides, you're going to check out the video to the right on the top. You're going to see how more common than not, pilots often see these craft in the skies, but because they're under the permissions of the uh, the FAA, they're not able to disclose many of their reportings or their sightings for fear of losing their job or being ridiculed, ridiculed or blacklisted. So a lot of this kind of gets suppressed. And of course, when you try to have a conversation about UFOs with anybody, um, it can go south really quick because they've been conditioned to push against and add resistance over the years in how all of this happened and that this phenomena would absolutely shatter reality as we know it. Um, a bunch of religions would get complicated. Um, but as we see here, the phenomena is undeniable. These are just a few of the thousands and thousands and thousands of sightings that are always seen everywhere in the world. This isn't local to one place or another. I know a lot of people talk about Area 51 and how they like to centralize and locate uh, UFOs to being in a desert re desertous region, but that's not the case. They are literally everywhere and anywhere that you can possibly imagine. And here are just a few external, um, some more videos that I have. And basically what you'll see is they really do prefer clouds. And the reason for it is because there's an opaqueness to the cloud that allows them to tuck and hide away without uh, really, you know, encountering any resistance from the external feature of, uh, of the environment. So they, from my research, they prefer clouds, they prefer um, volcanoes, tree cover, um, anything to really block the perceptual hindrance of being seen. And again, that is due primarily to in respect of our free will, if they allow themselves to be seen and land on the, the White House lawn, then it kind of defeats the purpose of why we're here to grow and really evolve as sovereign beings, because then they're just assisting us when we could do this all on our own. And that's ultimately what they want. And as you can see off to the, the far right is um, definitely one of the uh, reverse engineered craft that actually malfunctioned uh, due to one of the, um, the, uh, the gravity because what you should know about Earth is that gravity fluctuates. And these craft are specifically designed to propel against gravity, to actually create their own gravitational field. So when they come into these pockets of gravity um, and they dip and they bend, sometimes it can absolutely knock off their axis and uh, they can end up crashing down to Earth. This is a very real thing. And um, they're not invincible, or at least not the reverse engineered ones. Um, so that's that's what you're seeing in that clip right there. And so here's a, a clearer view of what we're actually dealing with here. And so if you tune your focus into the center of the screen, these are more of the positively polarized um, interdimensional extraterrestrial races that are actually coming in contact with Earth. And as you see, they have this uniformity to them. It's very structured. It's very nice, elegant. They have a little bit of style difference, but it's still relatively the same. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the inner workings of them as well. But you can see out to your left, these are a few artist renderings. And then off to the right is actually how they bend um, and warp reality around the craft to actually maneuver between dimensions. And this is especially important because everybody that's had sightings and have witnessed them just vanished into thin air, they weren't necessarily just cloaking and disappearing from sight. They were actually warping space time and actually moving into a different imperceivable dimension, um, uh, you know, aside our own. So that's how they pretty much evade um, detection at most times. And so when you start to study UFOs specifically, you'll notice that they sometimes have a very uh, uniform kind of um, formation and movement. And they, these kind of like uh, schematics, um, often called zigzags in the sky or maneuvers that they'll make, um, are often pitted against science and pitted against physics because if any occupant were inside that craft, they wouldn't be there on that 90 degree turn at, you know, a thousand miles per hour. That just isn't physically possible. And so 
what, what you need to really understand and connect the dots here is that if it's generating a gravitational wave around the craft itself, that means that the occupants are protected within that gravitational field, meaning that they have the same amount of gravity that they would on the ground if they were immersed in Earth's atmosphere and environment. So with the freedom to explore in this way, they commonly take different formations, shapes, and again, the formations are more so when multiple craft are traveling in tandem to actually observe so that they can stay on the mission because it's all a mission when they come here. There's no rendezvous. You know, this isn't a safari of the, uh, of the earth. Um, this, there is intention behind the visitation. So you have to understand that when they come here, they do so uh, with an objective. And often they like to stay close by each other, especially knowing the unpredictability of humans, as we've seen in the past, uh, them entering foreign airspace and actually trying to be shot at by a groundsman. So uh, pretty interesting. And then, of course, in the very center, you'll see film photographs of a bunch of these craft caught in pure daylight, some at night, but it's absolutely clear and distinct what we're seeing there. And then off to the right are the different variations. Um, as we'll discuss in a minute. But of course, you have all these things seen um, by many witnesses. This isn't just one at a time. Um, many of these are recurrent events and they're actually reciprocated as such. So that's, we basically are able to compile um, a database of what kind of general shape we're looking at because ultimately most of them have a, have a uniformity to them. And that could be due to not only their origins, but also uh, the means for the vessel itself. And so now we're gonna look at the schematics. We're gonna go under the hood of a UFO and you're gonna start to notice how these things actually work, how these things function. And um, in the very center at the top, this is actually the UFO that, um, the UFO schematic that Tesla designed um, was never put into production, but as you see, it is meant to really isolate and occupy into a consolidated region uh, pilots of the craft, which would kind of lead credence to the, you know, the bulge in the very center of the craft so that it can have occupants. And so off to the left, um, as many of you have probably heard or have tuned into, there was a scientist known as Bob Lazar, and he was working at Area 51 S4, which is an alternate facility off to the south. And it actually, um, he was actually given access to one of these craft that were recovered. And upon examining it, he realized that there was a very exotic design uh, attributed to these craft, meaning that there were a bunch of hexagonal patterns, um, especially on the outside where you would basically reach out your hand and before touching the craft itself, it would fold on its uh, hexagons outwardly creating a doorway and then if, when you walked in it closed back in on itself so these are semi-autonomous craft you have to realize that when you're when you're dealing with interdimensionality um, there are things that are beyond our perception and some things the universe creates have a very beautiful design to it that not only reflects sacred geometry but ease of convenience and so, as you see below on the, the, the left side, um, the entire HUD, the entire display around the craft, all those hexagonal patterns um, could become translucent, act as a window. So this isn't just some kind of limiting metal hunk of junk. This is a very intelligently designed craft, and it basically allows the occupant full transparency and uh, comfort while, while using it. But the one that Bob Lazar actually observed and had hands on, he went inside the craft itself. He said it was more so uh, retrofitted for a smaller occupant around four feet, three feet tall um, as the human size with the framing of uh, the ceiling and everything was just not comparable. So as you look at the bottom again, more schematics and then off to the right, you can actually see um, this is these are diagrams that Bob made in his observations that the the um, gravitational wave amplifiers that were situated at the bottom level of these craft would generate the um, the electromagnetic field, 
And then from that, if you position those in such a way, it acts like an oar on a boat or, a, a, you know, um, something to steer it in a specific way and create a different configuration. And so that's basically what they would do is they would, um, and, it, and also I want to make a point here is that a bunch of these craft, they don't have buttons, knobs, a steering wheel, anything of the sort. It was more so propelled by consciousness. Consciousness was a huge piloting feature of these craft. And I think it was actually beautiful how, you know, as we evolutionarily move on as a soul, we start to interface more with our own consciousness and then uh, are given these freedoms to uh, explore the universe with ease. And then we get to reverse engineering, which is, as, as I titled, the beginning of the end, meaning when humans make a good thing bad. And um, ultimately what happened, there was a mishap. Of course, you've heard of the Roswell case where there was a downed craft. And what this did was it gave scientists the means of rediscovering this exotic technology and trying to build it back you know, together. And while they were successful, um, they still had their shortcomings. It wasn't the exact um, design and style that was originally produced, but more of like a mock-up, like putting, you know, duct tape on a, on a broken car. So basically, th that's what happened is that these government agencies received um, that these, these pieces of technology and they, uh, they just went wild with it like a, a kid in a candy store. So we're just going to go through these really quickly. Um, Cover-ups, they made Roswell look like a weather balloon. Um, and then we have deep state infiltration, basically seeing an agenda and utilizing um, these things to their own degree of nefariousness. And then, of course, into the secret space program, um, you have all of these different agencies coming out, really explaining that, yes, they can do this and that this has been one big cover-up. And if you see the very center, all of the space agencies in the world have some sort of a vector shape to them. And this isn't by chance. The vector shape UFO, I have actually personally seen uh, perusing around the sun, um, moving throughout our solar system. So these, these are very real craft and it's almost like they're putting it in our face. And as many of you know by now, symbolism will be their downfall. So we'll keep an eye on that. And then we get into the TR-3B, the infamous triangle-shaped craft that so many people see nowadays. Um, as you can see in the center, here's a quick little demonstration, a little video. And then off to the left and right are personal captures I've made from the SOHO, Lasco C2, and C3 satellite, which actually observe the sun 24 hours a day. And I'm able to capture a small screenshot out of uh, thousands of photos taken. And so not many people have the patience to go through this, but I certainly do. And I'm here to show you the truth. And interestingly enough, the TR3B has a very real patent on Google. And if you are to look this up, official patent, and you just type that number, you'll see it for yourself. It's right there in plain day. They're not hiding anything. So they reverse engineer it, they patent it, and then they put it in our face saying, oh no, UFOs don't exist when they clearly do. And you don't have to go far, it's off Google. And then, of course, I wanted to mention the cigar-shaped craft as well. Very, very, um, very notable. I see them everywhere. They actually, these are more so the reverse engineering um, origins, because what they would do is they would take the technologies, the exotic technologies from the downed craft, and actually apply it to these UFOs that, I mean, sorry, these um, submarines that they had in the back, back in the day, the U-boats from uh, the German times. And basically the reason they did this is because the submarine had a very strong hull. It could, it could withstand pressure. And withstanding pressure not only means the ocean, but space. And so you have this perfect tank of a vehicle that when retrofitted with free energy, um, electro-gravitic uh, technology, um, you can start to see the, uh, the opportunities at play. So of course, I have a bunch of my own personal captures of these um, seen all around our solar system and around the sun, um, just constantly moving. And for the most part, they travel in tandem, they travel in groups. And the reason being is that these have been transferred into cargo ships that actually transfer um, not only uh, personnel, but a bunch of equipment throughout the solar system, which is why, while the mainstream media won't tell you this, 
um, there is an occupation on multiple planets, on multiple moons, um, bases, underground bases. And this is how they actually transfer a bunch of the, uh, the tech and the equipment. And so as you'll see here, we have the ISS doing a uh, surveillance um, of the Earth doing technical, and they capture one accidentally, and then watch what happens. Once they realize what, they, what they're capturing on camera, since it's a live feed, they cut the feed. They don't want anybody noticing this, and they don't want to acknowledge it in the slightest. So this is part of the Solar Warden program. And basically, they, they started to retrofit these to do exactly what I just said, which is to transport crew, personnel, and equipment off-world for their own reasons. And um, this has a darker implication, too, with um, the human trafficking uh, slave trade. And this is a very real thing, and I think that's for another video, but definitely look into that. And then, of course, these UFOs, they are multifaceted, meaning that they are not bound to one thing. If they can survive in space, they can survive underwater. And so when we refer to USOs, underwater submerged objects, you have to realize that they have explored every part of this planet possible. And going through these phenomena, you start to take a sense of, you know, we haven't really explored our oceans to, to the depth that we have wanted to or to the degree we have wanted. So it's, of course, a perfect hotbed for UFOs to hide away and get away from the eyes of um, the populace in a very quick and clean manner. And of course, these were captured by a Navy submarine um, surfacing right out of the water through the periscope. And uh, they're very active. They are always circling around uh, oceans, even around volcanoes. Believe it or not, these vehicles, some of them can withstand the temperatures of lava. So I think it's absolutely incredible. And they would go through the lava tubes themselves to actually get deeper into the earth. So that, that's one way of travel. And so this is one of the examples of the uh, UFOs. This is the Baltic Sea anom anomaly. And basically it kind of looks like uh, the Millennium Falcon, but it has very distinctive features. It has steps, it has concave, um, a circular structure. So this is nothing natural. This is definitely planted. And as you can see off to the left, it almost looked like it crashed landed there and was left for ruin. So definitely look into that. And then of course, as stated prior in this uh, conference, there is the benevolent contact of channeling, meaning that if you wanna establish contact, you don't have to wait for the mainstream to do it. You can go out and experience it for yourself. And just as I said before, the benevolent ones that are in contact with us often use telepathy to communicate. So this is how we really access and come together with our consciousness under one uh, unified voice. And uh, again, you know, if, you, if you're willing and you want to call that experience in, they're happy to answer that call. And here is one of those encounters. Um, basically, what you're seeing is they have green laser lights that they're pointing at these craft, just signaling them. Uh, not doing any harm to the craft itself. But basically, as, as they're observing and they start to stimulate um, the craft with light, as you're going to see right here, um, a fantastic thing happens where they'll illuminate and they'll actually make themselves known, kind of the inverse of what they're trying to do because they know they're amongst um, positive, polarized individuals who aren't going to be harmed from the experience of seeing such um, and, and witnessing such a phenomena. So it's absolutely incredible, and I highly recommend to look into CE5, or better yet, just go out and stargaze. You never know what's waiting for you out there, or if you have star family looking back that wants to communicate, there's so much out there to be seen and observed, um, yeah, as you see right there. <laughs> and so again, we have extended family throughout the stars. Um, you could see there, there are all these different races in our nearby cluster of space, and that's why there's such a presence is because we are in this galactic neighborhood is so full of life and evolved life at that, that there comes a point where you want to turn back and serve others and you want to help because you realize the unity of oneness, that we are all together and we're all sharing this experience. And it's it's powerful. And, and just in the right, as we heard earlier in the conference, um, they there's a reason they don't just come down and shake our hands and, and say hello is because their vibration is so intense that if they were to come down and actually meet you, 
your cells wouldn't be able to actually keep up with the vibration that they output. So that's why we make a conscious and active effort to raise our vibration on a daily basis, because that is the process of ascension. That's where we're moving into a place that they have achieved, but they're trying to watch and make sure that we make the gap as well. And so, um, as you see, a bunch of other NASA old school footage from the 90s, um, stuff they'll never release, but of course was leaked. And you could just imagine what it was like back then when there was freedom, when there wasn't the technology to capture all of this. You didn't, you know, camcorders were so clunky and out of focus, you couldn't even get something like this. And so to watch an entire colony of um, UFOs just travel outside the atmosphere um, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a breathtaking view. And if this is the first time you're seeing this, this is very real footage. There's more like it. Um, but again, as we moved and we progressed as, hum um, as humanity developed, it became less and less with the technolog uh, technological advancements. So they just want to remain hidden. And of course, when we have a, a HD 4K camera pointed at them, it kind of defeats the purpose. And so just really quickly, these are a few other ones that are out there in more of a 3D model aspect. So you can see um, A8 at the top is, resembles more of a top hat and uh, it kind of works its way around. But ultimately, they kind of take the same size and shape. I mean, they're not scaled to size, but basically all of these really represent what, have been, what has been visiting humanity over the years. And I think it's absolutely incredible. And also, if you're just joining us now, um, I have been currently updating my Telegram channel with this new um, with this new grouping of sightings, um, both domestic and international. And when I say domestic, I mean the United States. And I realized that while everybody says UFOs come and go, there may be you know ten sightings, a hundred sightings that might be real. I see every single day how many people are reporting UFOs that have no other intention to do it than curiosity. And these are everyday people, you know, in rural areas or even populous cities that'll catch a glimpse. As you see, there's a duration, there's the location. And I have hundreds more like this, hundreds. And that's only me curating what I've seen too. There's so many more. So just realize that this phenomena is much more common than we've been led to believe. And with that being said, thank you so much for joining me here at my Star Bloom talk. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, I go by Junk DNA, and we have a, tr a Spanish translated page, Junk DNA underscore ES, Espanol, and then also Star Bloom Fest, the original, if you want to keep tabs on the festival, um, we're going to be updating everything there. And then just recently launched is the Quantum Light, um, and this is a place for channelings and divine wisdoms that kind of resolve around frequencies, vibration, energy, crystals, um, very, very highly curated. And then uh, the t.me, Junk DNA and Friends, that is my Telegram channel. I am very active there. Again, that's where I'm going to be posting the domestic and international sightings um, all the time. So definitely check that out. And then, of course, uh, Junk DNA, here, let me put that in one more time. Then uh, junkdna.me, that's my website. If you want to go browse, it's very beautiful. I keep it up to date. And then um, Spotify down there, that is where I host the Ascension Dimension, which is my podcast. I've had amazing um, guests. There's hours of content, so definitely tune in. It's on Spotify, Apple Music, and it goes by the Ascension Dimension. <laughs>